You guys are going to be able to drive just straight out of church and then you're going to be able to get to the restaurant and everybody will be leaving and then you'll get your seats. And um, and if anyone needs their bill paid, see this wealthy rich man in the front row. He will pray that somebody at the restaurant will pray will pay for it. Um, but we just welcome you guys. I am just talking to my my wonderful handsome husband walks up here, and we have a PowerPoint that we're going to be sharing. Let's give a round of applause to all our volunteers and everyone in the sound booth here, and um, technology and our co-teachers, which is um, um, Keith and Sarah. All right, thank you guys for always being here, you guys. Thank you, um, Keith and Sarah, for covering when we weren't here and blessing people. And this is all new. Is this just something new up here? It's just extra. Okay, well, I'm going to move it because knowing me, I'm a little extra. I don't want to fall on it. All right. So I'm Michelle, and this is? Uh, I'm Jeff. Thank you very much. Michelle and Jeff Collins. This is our second and our last marriage. Um, Jeff's been married before. I did a trial run before. It didn't work out. So this is my real marriage. <laughs> and, um, and I'm going to continue to be in marriage groups like this and continue to grow because it helps me and um, it helps me to love uh, my husband the way he deserves to be loved and, and my family. And will you guys raise your hand if you were in service? All of you guys. Was that not a powerful message or what? I mean, wow, she was incredible. So what we're talking about this month, it's a whole new subject, it's a whole new month. Selfless communication. And she, we could have actually just literally, thank you, Pastor Clark. Thank you. We could have just literally um, just replayed her message because, man, that was perfect, right? Yeah. So um, we are going to talk about, and we're going to go through this pretty quickly because we have about 30 minutes. And, when we're and lots just, of slides and lots of information. Like always. I, I, I'm kind of like on information overload. I'm really good at giving you a lot of information. Um, and one of the things I'm gonna do my very best to do, I typically record um, as many of these classes as I possibly can when we're not on vacation. We've got a YouTube channel, it's Jeff and Michelle Collins, Lakewood Marriage. I'm gonna try to attach this, this PowerPoint, these PDFs to that video that we're recording so you'll have access to these, these PDF slides as well. All right, let's go ahead and get started with prayer. And if you guys need prayer after this, we will have prayer partners on this side or this side. side. But um, if you need prayer. All right, Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everyone that showed up and everyone that will watch this. Father, thank you that it's not about Jeff and me. It's about you, Father. And that um, you will just show up and show out in our lives. And Father, that whatever words we speak, that you will help them be delivered and let them hear what they need to hear and let them love each other the way they need to love, but most of all, love you first and um, put you first, the marriage second, the children and everything else after. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 So uh, Michelle and I um, collaborated on this, which is, is, you know, we always try to do, but- It's getting better uh, and better. It's getting better and better as we, as we, as we work on this together. And so we, we read all kinds of scriptures. I've got all kinds of scriptures. We, we watched podcasts, we Googled, we Wikified it, wikipedia it, I should say. Um, we had intense fellowship back and forth. Oh, yeah, yeah, like. yeah. And so, uh, you know, selfless communication. I'm, I'm just gonna say this, and I hope you walk away remembering this. If you remember nothing else, remember this. In all of these marriage classes, in all of the marriage books, in all of the stuff you're gonna read about marriages, in relationships, and communication, it's very, very similar what you're going to read, hear, and understand. Even the Bible communicates exactly the same thing that you're gonna read in all of these things. The key point to all of this is getting into action. Take it to heart, find the pieces that resonate, grow into the pieces that maybe don't resonate but are good, and put it into action. You being here in this class is one of the greatest steps you could take. You praying with your spouse, one of the greatest steps you could take. Finding a Bible, cracking it open, looking for that thing, just turning a page and seeing what God reveals to you. That's going into action. 
So one of the first things in the nine steps of, of selfless communication is number one, in your marriage with your spouse, be inviting, be open, be vulnerable. Be inviting means welcoming, validating, and including your spouse into your life. Don't withdraw, don't push them out. Into your heart, taking down the walls, becoming vulnerable, and to your vulnerable places. On Mark 10, 46 through 52, Jesus was not afraid to stop what he was doing, potentially inconveniencing himself and all the people that were following him to selflessly invite others into a connection and relationship with him. Nor was he afraid to be different from the crowd. The Pharisees had this air of order and correctness about them. Jesus did exactly the opposite of that because he wanted the relationship. He understood the law, but he wanted the relationship. Jesus is inviting. He was interested. He was giving. He saw past Bartimaeus' behavior. This is when Bartimaeus was making a loud ruckus in the crowd while Jesus was doing his thing coming through. And he understood what was in Bartimaeus' heart. Not what his actions were doing, not what his actions were creating, not the cause and effect of his, of, of his actions. And think about that with your spouse. When you react to your spouse, when you respond to your spouse, when you communicate to your spouse, are you responding to the action or the intent of their heart? So what we're going to go through, what Jeff has started, this is the first one, if you're taking notes, it's being inviting. We all, someone invited you here, whether it was through a website, whether it was through um, a friend, or whether it's you being in service. And we're going to talk about different things that will help you be selfless instead of being a more, when we communicate, I tend to be more selfish. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the next one is being um, admitting, admitting, is that correct, Jeff? Admitting. 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 I don't know why I changed that word, admitting. Jesus teaches that we should focus on, on own, wait, I'm sorry. Jesus is focused on, you want to read that first part? <laughs> so uh, Jesus teaches that we should focus on, own, weigh. and weigh the wrongs in our heart before pointing out the specks in others. I love that. Um, rather than being self-protected, self-righteous, and self-interest, you can help your spouse because of caring for, because of the care we have for those God put in our lives. This is really big to me because so many times I want to protect my family the way I think they should be protected. I want them to walk the way I want them to walk, to speak the way I want them to speak. I want them to serve God and read the Bible and go to church and, and don't say negative things. I do all this, these things to my grown adults when all I have to do is just really do it onto God and let them see. So it's not my way, it's his way, and just be an example for them. In um, Proverbs 18, 13, uh, Jeff wants me to look here because it's easier. <laughs> it says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is foully, folly, and a shame. That's me. I want to give an answer to Jeff. I want to give an answer to my children. I want to give an answer to my clients and business before I listen. And when we were going through these slides and through these passages, I was convicted. I, I was like, Jeff, this is so good for me. I know that the only way I can love and communicate healthy and be in communication that's going to be a godly way is by me getting quiet. God gave me a gift to jab, to be to jab and to talk and, and be aggressive when I need to be aggressive, but I need to learn the, the patience and the, the time to be silent. And that takes work. And what I need to do is call on the Holy Spirit and say, this is not a natural gift. I have learned to, I say I grew up in a war zone with four other sisters. I mean, I never even started the, my, the, my life because in the womb I shared it with another girl, my twin sister. So I've said I've always been fighting to be heard and always fighting to get out first. But he says there was a time for that and there's a time to be quiet. There's a time to be still. He gave me someone that's a complete opposite of that. He's sometimes so quiet, it makes me mad. So he's like, learn from him, and then he can learn from you. Do you want to read that last Yeah, yeah a perfect example of, of that situation when you describe the war zone, when you've got a very energetic type of conversation in your, in your family. I, I almost get this image in my head of when somebody's talking in your family, the rest of you are reloading. 
So true. Instead of going, oh, you said, no, you're reloading to shoot right back. That's so good, Joe. Can you say that at our next get together? Uh, I don't know how well it would be received, but sure. <laughs> But it's interesting that we say this because God gave me what I needed. He didn't give me someone exactly like me. He gave someone exactly almost opposite so that when I can draw on his strengths, he can draw on my strengths, and together we can become one, and we can share each other's gifts. So on the next slide, um, the next, next piece, the next step is be forgiving. This one just kind of thumped me in the forehead really hard, really hard. Um, this is one of my major challenges. Uh, I have a tendency to internalize a lot. I have a tendency to remember past hurts. And that's the exact opposite of forgiving. Um, it, it says in here, once we admit where we need mercy. And, you know, we, we've, many of us have heard the, the adages, you know, ha being unforgiving is like drinking the poison and expecting it to hurt the person that you wanted to drink the poison in the first place. It, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. We are better able to forgive others for their shortcomings when we have mercy on our own lives. And that's a daily prayer for myself. Being forgiving is a form of giving to others. That's why it's a, it's a step in selflessness. It, it, it's a way of, of selfless uh, cleaning, a, you know, clearing a debt in a relationship. Forgiveness is not something that can be faked. <laughs> uh, darn it. <laughs> yeah, that's a lesson for me. You know, it's interesting that you say that because what just rose up in my spirit is that I know when you're holding on to something now because I've watched your behavior. Yeah. And usually you'll pray it over us, like let us forgive. And I'm thinking, I'm, I don't know what I'm supposed to be forgiving. A lot and of that's what I hear, <laughs> it's that he's still wanting to work. And, and it, it, it is funny. But at the same moment, I used to get offended by it and get angry, but now I'm like, okay, this is, he's really asking God to cover us because he's still working through something, and I need to give him grace and mercy and time for that. And, and what you just gave a perfect example of selfish versus selfless. Yes. You're looking at it from a selfless perspective. When you got mad at me, thinking, oh, he's just jab, 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 jab at me, that's selfish. You're giving me grace through my inequity. Yeah, I love that. You know what's so funny that um, Jeff used to get, I used to get mad if Jeff seemed mad. <laughs> Early in our marriage, if he walked in with an attitude or he seemed like he had an attitude. Can't I just be mad? <laughs> and, and, and no, the answer is yes and no. The answer is yes and no. Because what we learned to do is, I told him one day, finally, he's like, I never noticed, I never thought that. I would get mad because he was mad, and it might be work, it might be his video game, it might be a driver in the room. I always assumed, because we, us women live in the world of we need security, so I assumed that he was mad at me. There was something going on. And all he started to finally say is, I'm all peopled out, it's not you, we're good. And then immediately I'd be like, oh, I don't need to be mad at him. And just that little word is, we're good, we're good. Um, helped me to say, and even my family would be like, he looks mad. I'm like, yeah, he's probably going through something. And it took years for me to get through that and to understand that. And it's been, it was exhausting. And in, in Matthew 5, 7, it says, blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown mercy. And this one, it, it's one that hit me a little less in the head and a little bit more in the heart. And when I have become vulnerable and transparent with my wife and ask forgive, for forgiveness or given forgiveness. It's a lot easier for me to ask for it because I'm, I'm pretty good at owning the mistakes that I make. It's, it's tougher for me personally, this is just me personally, to forgive. And I needed to figure out how to separate. Forgiveness is, is allowing Jesus, Jesus to do his work with whoever did me wrong. Allowing Jesus to be my vindicator. I don't have to hold that personal grudge. Letting it go. I'm not saying that what they did is right. I'm not saying, it's okay, do it again. That's not what I'm saying when I'm forgiving. I'm saying, I'm going to let it go. I'm putting, I literally have to take this picture of rocks this bag of rocks, probably 150 pounds on my shoulders, and just shrugging my shoulders and letting it drop at the feet of Jesus and saying, I can't do this. I'm strong, 
I'm big, I'm well equipped, I'm intelligent, but I can't do this. You're handsome. Thank you very much. Can I read this next slide? My one? beautiful, gorgeous wife. Thank you. Can I read this next slide? You should see it in her bathing suit. Stop. Oh, <laughs> wow. Wow. Bur uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 24. Um, pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. This is Ashley. If you hear Ashley talk, um, Clayton and Ashley, this is one of her favorite scriptures. Pleasant words are, are as are as a honeycomb sweet to the soul and healing to the bones you guys when you speak words that are sweet and kind to your spouse just like we did i mean he went a little overboard and embarrassed me but then he he literally lights up early in our marriage we used to work in different places we work together now and i would text him throughout the day and say thank you thank you for you know being my husband thank you for saying yes to me thank you for loving me thank you for for everyone around you today is so blessed to be with you because you are going to bless them and it would do what to you i mean what oh, it would light me up it would energize me if somebody came at me with with some adversity or something uh it allows a lot of that to just kind of roll off of me i've got a grace i've got a covering um a little bit off topic here, but God put you and your spouse together for reasons. And when you cover your spouse, you're energizing, you're, you're turning up the volume, whatever analogy you want to use on the blessing of the covenant that God created from the very, from the very beginning of creation. In Genesis, when God talks about uh, um, uh, the two shall become one, that is a covenant contract of energizing God's blessing in your life. And when you do that to your spouse, you're activating, turning the volume up, whatever that is. Speaking life over that. Speaking them. life over that. Yes. Okay, so on the next slide, the next step is. Be serving. You know, it's very easy to serve at work. It's very easy to serve at church, but we need to serve in our marriage. We need to serve you know, and serve at a high level. Um, Jesus teaches us not to be, not to concern ourselves with our position, status, or performance. What matters is deciding to concern ourselves with serving the needs and desires of others. What, this is so true because so many times, and especially early in our relationship, is um, I grew up very poor. So when I could afford to buy clothes, it, it was a status to me. I wanted to look good, smell good, and be right. That's very young and very, very um, immature. And I remember when I was first dating Jeff, if he didn't wear something or he, we were going to a nice dinner, I remember going out with our bo my boss, he put shorts on and we were going to this nice steak dinner. I mean, we literally got into this heated argument over the fact, and he said, it doesn't matter what I wear, I'm going with you and we're gonna have a great time. And I could not see it that way. And it was, I got quiet with God and was praying and God said, does it matter more what people think and see of your husband or what I think and see of your husband? Wow, when he checked that with me, I was like, wear whatever you want. I mean, now he comes to me and says, does this look right? Does this look good? It has changed full circle. And that's a perfect example of selfish versus selfless. When, when we got to that point in our relationship, when we got to that point in our marriage, I stopped resisting and pushing against her. You should look, you should, this is the image you should portray. If you're gonna be with me, you should be blah, blah, blah. It's like throw I can't blah. say all that. <laughs> but that, that's how I did not look like that or say that, but thank you. But that's how it's received. And that's what selfless communication is all about. That's part of this message is your intent may be great, great. Have a great intent, wonderful. How is it being received by your spouse? That's an important part of the selfless communication. And when we got to that point, when it became less of a, a push in my mind, I had to grow, I had to learn. I started realizing that the selfless, the way I can show up selfless is to ask, hey, what, what do you think that would be a great thing to wear to where we're going? So we only have 30 minutes today, but the only way I got healed from that is by going going back to God and saying, it wasn't about changing Jeff, it was about changing me. 
what am I, why do I need this God? And he, I, I got quiet with him and I got quiet with myself and got quiet with my coach. And the real thing was, is it part of acceptance? And that's part, we can't get into all that. If you heard our testimony, it's part of growing up. It was, it's an acceptance piece. I couldn't be healed overnight. I had to go back to the root of why I needed him to show up this way and why I needed to show up this way. And it was part of a healing piece of it. And it was, because I live in a space that growing up in the, in, the, in the life that we did, and we were super blessed and super loved, but with all the dysfunction, we all have it, mine was shame and acceptance. And I still, the enemy still tries to sometimes come and present that. And when he knows that, he can cover me. He can protect me and he can tell me, is, you know, what's going on right now? What's happening? What's doing this? I'm going to read just the last one. Um, uh, I love this paragraph. Okay, can you read that one again? Uh, to, to me, this is one of the toughest things in marriage. Toughest things in marriage, just for me personally. It may not be for you, for me. A selfless marriage is the best kind because it's not predicated on getting our needs met, but, and, and here's the highlight for me, but acting independently of how our spouse treats us. By definition, that's the switch from selfish to selfless. If I can react, I, if I can just be more like Jesus and respond and act to my spouse, regardless of how she treats me. And that's tough. So, so tough for me. So tough for me. Most of the marriages that we have the honor to be able to talk to and be able to meet with, um, the number one thing is honor and pride that they're, 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 they have up. That's the guard they're wearing. And they're like, he doesn't treat me like this or she doesn't treat me like this. Why am I going to do this for them? And that's the line of the enemy. And that's the bondage and the trap Bingo. that you have around you and what happens is that it's always, always about, I do this for them, but they don't do this for me. And when we look at it that way, we will stay in the trap and the bondage. We're not in prison, and we know we may have a family member or a friend or heard of someone in prison, and they are being told what to do every single day, but we create our own prison in our marriages. We create our own dysfunction, and we create our own bondages. And when we can break those shackles and break those things, we can be free to love and free to receive, you know, and that is the biggest piece. And on this last one, do you want to read this last one, maybe? That uh, selfish love is focused on getting what one can gain from their partner and the relationship. Selfless love is about sacrificing everything for your spouse and accepting them without judgment. I asked the Holy Spirit and the mistake I had is I tried to do this in my first marriage. I tried to do that without God's grace and help. And I tried to do that in this marriage and it doesn't work. I have to tell the Holy Spirit, teach me how to love him. Teach me how to get quiet. Teach me and be with me when I want to react out of my own flesh because I want something. I'm a selfish, selfish human being. And I have to die to myself to be able to love him unconditionally. And that's the work in progress. So I'm gonna move through this next one. It's, it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, to be selfless, be available. You know, an important part of selflessness is a decision to value your spouse enough to be available for them and what interests and, and, and interested in them. Um, you know, availability communicates that we value another greatly, more, more than ourselves. It's an act of self-sacrifice and selflessness that places oneself aside to listen to, to consider, to feel for, to understand your spouse. I tell you what, men, um, the reaction I get from my wife and her sense of security when I do just these simple little things, the reward is, is priceless. You can't put a price on that. And if I do those things, and I'm not saying I do this to get, but if I do those things, if I got a buddy that calls me up and says they want to go play golf the next day, my wife is probably going to be a lot more uh, open to the idea of me going and playing golf instead of saying, hey, there's a lot of stuff around the house that I could use your help with. Right. You know, there's a perfect example of this um, past, set, what was it Friday? I think it was Friday. We went to breakfast. And we just got back from a trip and we have eaten and indulged in a lot of food and desserts and everything else. 
And um, Jeff goes back to his regular programming that he, he fasts in the morning. He doesn't eat till after 12. Well, I was hungry and I wanted to go eat and I wanted- You were hungry. I was hungry and there was no food because we just got back from out of town. And I said, let's go eat, then we'll go grocery shopping. He said, okay. I wasn't even thinking about the time. And I'm sitting at the restaurant and I'm like, where's your food? Where's your food? I kept saying it. He's like, I didn't order. It's like 1030. That act of selfish, selfless love and communication. He never looked at me and said, well, I'm not, not going to drive you to a restaurant when I'm not going to eat. And then when I ordered, he didn't say like, oh, well, hurry up and order. I mean, I thought he ordered and I was waiting. He never made me feel bad. If I was fasting till after 12 and he asked me to go eat with him at one of the restaurants I love, I probably would I, well, I'm not going to say probably, I wouldn't have been that nice. And I looked at him with so much love and I said, thank you, first of all, for driving me. Thank you for eating with me and thank you for just coming. And he's like, yeah, no problem. And that is being completely available and gracious in love. I mean, it may sound silly, but it was so, it was so much love in that moment is that I just want to take you. I, I just can't believe you did that. So thank you. I'm working on it. <laughs> All right. Jesus, you know. Go play right? golf the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He played so, golf twice last week, I, by the way. Thank you. Um, I, I love this 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 one in here where it says Jesus Jesus often displayed his availability to others around him in a way that was shocking and groundbreaking. He noticed people that others ignored. He would touch people who were cast out. So how good. many how many times per day do you have things coming against you? How many times per day do you have other people, maybe not the nicest, maybe not saying the nicest things, maybe throwing up fingers that aren't very nice. If your spouse has the ability to be available for you and build you up and love you, all of that stuff gets cast aside. All of that stuff means less. You know, it is interesting because that spirit of joy will rub off on you. That's why we say hang out with people that you want to be like. Hang out with married couples. Look around today. All these couples are either going to get married or are married. And these are the people that you want to link arms with. Not only here, but outside. I have a friend that is going through a divorce right now. And the first thing I said is, because I haven't seen her in a couple of years, is I said, who is your spouse hanging out with? And the person he, he was, he, they're hanging out with had already went through a divorce two years before. Because hmm. we will... Whether we like it or not, if we hang out with joy, joy will rub off on us. If we hang out with anger, anger will, will right. show up with us. If we hang out with divorced people, divorce can come upon us. If we hang out, we hung out with a couple last week that is very grounded in their marriage and very grounded in the word. And one day they called us out on something because we were not being so kind to It was actually all Jeff not being kind to me. Just kidding. <laughs> but, um, and it was just a little self argument, but they immediately called us out. I felt, I don't know what you felt, but I'm like, I'm embarrassed. The word comes to mind is convicted. I felt convicted, but we immediately went back and did what we were supposed to do. Because At least I did. Good friends, <laughs> good friends, good friends should tell you what is not pleasing to God, but love you through the process. That's right. And friends that don't do that, be careful because they're not going to want you to call them out when they're not doing stuff that they're wrong. They're wrong too. And they're typically going to feed the dysfunction. And they'll feed the dysfunction. Yeah, All right. Uh, admiring. Uh, admire, praise, encourage your spouse in all the ways that's being selfless. When you do this, we're able to shift the focus from ourselves, from envy, competition, um, of competitiveness, or insecurities, and instead focusing on admiring and encouraging each other. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Worry weighs a person down, and encouraging word cheers a person up. That is so big for me, because especially for women, and I don't know if you women are like me, but I tend to worry about everything. I worry about who they're hanging out with. I worry about who my husband, what my husband's um, going to think about dinner or the trip or the money or the what. And it's stuff that he may not even want, but we just tend to take on this worry. And I think that the enemy wants to keep us there because yes. when we're there, we're not focused on what God is because God is not about worry. God is not about fear. God is not about um, tying us up in those bondages. God's about love, peace, and joy. So when the enemy can distract us, that is when we lose our focus. Um, Ephesians 4, 29, 32 says, let no corruption, corrupt communication proceed out of Michelle's mouth. 
but what is good to use for edifying that it may minister grace into the hearers. You know, I put my name a lot of times in the scriptures that I'm reading because I need to be reminded, Michelle, if you do this, God's telling you, my daughter, I promise you this. Because sometimes we read the scripture and it just goes, it goes like, it's just like a high and by in the elevator. You don't get anything from it. It doesn't take away and you just move right on. But when I put the scripture up and he's talking directly to me, because he's talking directly to you guys, it really does stay with me. And, and I want to change and I want to be better to you and to the, our children. Thank you. All right. So the next slide is be empathetic. And how many of you, don't raise your hands, please. How many of you have ever said to your spouse, I can't read your mind. How can you expect me to know what you want or you think or you're feeling? I can't read your mind. How many of you either have said it or felt it? Don't raise your hand, please. There is a difference. There is a difference when it comes to selflessness, when it comes to selfless communication. There is a difference between trying to figure out what's going on in their head, trying to figure out why they did what they did, versus being empathetic to why, what is the environmental effects that may be causing them to react that way. If you were in their position, this is by definition empathy. If you were in their position, how would you feel? How would you react? How would you show up? That is empathy. So if you said words out of your mouth to your spouse, if you turned around and you were empathetic and said, if that person said that to me, I probably would have reacted. I probably would have done this. When you can be empathetic, it gives you the ability to have more grace in your response, in your thoughts, and in your emotions, and it allows you the opportunity to let Jesus come into that situation, and the Holy Spirit. So empathy is the ability to sense, understand, and imagine what your spouse is thinking and feeling. Not to guess, it is the ability to put yourselves in their place to perceive and to understand what they might think, feel, need, or desire. It is not always convenient, but it is a powerful display of selflessness that can have a profound impact on your marriage. Just like that, that paragraph a couple of bits ago, it doesn't matter how they're treating you. If you take that empathy, put that into the situation, you become empathetic. I tell you what, if there's a problem in your marriage, you take one of these steps and you apply it and figure out which step are you not doing, I think things will probably get a lot better really quick. Amen. God and Jesus see our thoughts. They understand our feelings, our needs, our desires. They are able to understand and act in empathy and love towards us. And I'll take that even a step further. God knows the beginning from the end and he'll already have the answer of what we need right there waiting for us if we stop getting out of our head and we let that grace and that empathy into our hearts this empathy produces in us confidence and peace as we rely on the graciousness of god and if that is not one of your gifts because we talk about the clifton strength finders then you need to really rely on the, rely on the holy spirit to be able to help you in that area because when it's not your natural gift it will be a struggle in our flesh to do that all right, you want to read just a couple of these because we're running out of time and I want to get to the last two. Sure, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so the, on the next slide... Which be, one resonated with you yeah, the most? <laughs> the, the one that resonated with me the most is uh, 2 Corinthians. Be initiating. Initiating, and I talked about this at the beginning of class. Put it into action. What you're hearing today, put it into action. Put it into action. Put it into action. On uh, 2 Corinthians 5, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced Convinced that one died for us all and therefore all died with Jesus and he died for all and those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again and I'll sum up on this page what I think is I do um, I do a lot of things right in 
my kids' eyes. I've drugged them at church, like Cece said. I pray for them and everything else. But one thing that convicted me is when she said about stubbing my toe. Because I'll scream and yell, and it's not, thank you, Jesus, for letting me do that right now. And that initiating is, I can't do it 90%. I need to do it 100%. And I can't blame my spouse or anything else. I got to look at me and initiate the love for him 100% so that they can love the way we love and serve the way we serve and give the way we, we give so that they can see that 100%. I agree. That's awesome. So on the next slide, be persevering. I love perseverance. Um, I am a very goal-oriented, task-oriented, check-mark kind of guy. Really? I am. <laughs> if you didn't notice, at 12.53, I finished this. It's but, everything. Um, Your whole life. So perseverance is, is the putting into action. It, it, I want to accomplish something. And one thing that my wife came up with, she, she brought this to my attention, and I'm like, oh, that's so good is she's helping to prepare me to meet Jesus. It's not her responsibility, but she is helping to prepare me to meet Jesus. And if I get out of my own way, out of my own selfishness, and become more selfless, we, pre we persevere through the difficult things. Marriage is work. Marriage can be difficult sometimes. But as you persevere, you grow, and guess what? You get to share what you learn. And what he means by that, and that's such a great point, Jeff, I know you're going to bring that up, was um, if I know what triggers Jeff, and I know that, um, you know, calling him out on his driving is going to make him angry, then I'm giving him an opportunity to get angry. When I'm preparing him and helping him to prepare to be Jesus, God's going to look at me and not say, I know he drove like that. He's going to say, who did I entrust you in? And I gave you a role as his wife to be his helper, not to be his referee, not to be his judge, not to be the police. He's going to ask me, what did I do with the precious people in my life that allowed me to be there and how I showed up? Not to raise his head where he's almost standing up when he's snoring. <laughs> you know, and have that discussion, like I said, would you rather me wake you up? and tell you to turn around or get your remote because he has his side of the bed and my side and I just keep raising them. He's like, but you get up. I'm so far up. Last I night, wake up night. half folded. <laughs> last night, I said, well, you wouldn't stop. So I had to keep going slowly. I'm like, it was four in the morning for me. Look at my post. I posted at four in the morning because I was up because you're sorry. So I'm, I'm laying like this and I end up like this. So, <laughs> so you didn't answer me. Would you rather me wake you up and tell you to turn or raise the bed? Well, we talked about that. I answered that. I said, just raise me up. Okay. Well, just raise me up. I'd rather be asleep I'm than wake up half to, I'm getting you closer. I'm getting you closer to Jesus. I'm getting you closer to Jesus. So all that's right. a, that, that's all the that's the nine steps. We have two more slides. That would take one minute. Yeah, I think we should just close on prayer because we're getting close to one thirty. Okay. Um, I, I, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna attach these slides. We, we just some great information on how to improve the way you communicate is on the next slide and then how to talk to your partner uh, partner about your needs is on the slide after that so I'm going to attach this to our video when we get that loaded up I have one thing to say that I don't know why it just came in my mind whether it's God or me is I'm going to encourage you guys to do one activity for me is sometime between now and next Sunday which is seven days I want you to put your phone you record a lot of stuff you watch a lot of stuff Put your phone on and set it to where you guys spend the most time, whether it's in the kitchen, the living room, wherever you're at with your spouse. And I want you to record as much as you can, and I want you to go back and just don't do anything but you, what you normally do. And go back and see if the words that you're saying and the way you're showing up is selfless or if it's self-serving and if God would be pleased with the things you're saying to your children and to yourself and to your family. So, and then when you do that, share it with somebody and ask them to do that too. Because we can't fix what we're not aware of. And sometimes we think our tongue isn't sharp and this is just the way I show up. I'm a highly aggressive, passionate person. But when it's fired off at him, it is not healthy. And um, I have to learn to love him passionately and be aggressive and it not be targeted and come out with fire and flames at times. 
And then, and then the other excuse I used to say, well, God made me like this. No, God didn't make me like that. That's right. God made me gentle, loving, and kind to serve, Amen. not to be um, aggressive and mean. The um, enemy tries to push you. To believe that. To believe that that's just how you are. And candor is wonderful because we all need it, but care, you can never be candor with someone without care. If I have to address Jeff snoring, it can't be like, you kept me up all night. It has to be, honey, I keep waking up. What can I do to help? And then I asked him, do you want me to sleep with, um, with earplugs? He's no. like, absolutely not. So then he immediately wants to help me. Only if you want. Yeah, he, oh, then he wants to <laughs> Can you want to help me? All right, let's pray. You want to pray with me? Uh, go ahead. Uh, Father God, thank you for the words we heard today, Father. You are a perfect example of not being, um, of being selfish, less with us, Father. That we will love one another, that we will show up like you with love, grace, and mercy, Father. May each couple, Father, get quiet with themselves and figure out how they can love their spouse, their loved ones, and everyone you entrust in them with, Father, that they show up with grace, love, and mercy, including Jeff and I. Father, thank you for a great week ahead of them. Bless their their finances. Bless them abundantly, Father, in their businesses and their relationships. And Father, with their health, may they, may they be blessed, loved, and may they know who they are in your life. And that's the apple of your eye, Father. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you guys don't know yet, we have uh, a marriage retreat we do in Cancun at LeBlanc. Our next one is February 2023. Um, you can find it at dreammarriageretreat.com. Um, We're starting to take payments now. We sold out last year. So if you want a spot, you have to let us know. And the only way you guarantee your spot is by making a deposit. Um, we sold out last year. We will sell out this year. We have about three couples that have already said yes. But if you're interested, please let us know. It's a, it's a completely amazing time there. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. How are you beautiful?